finish out of that shoe. What does that mean when you see one shoe in the... Where's the other shoe? I mean, what guys went deaf and threw one shoe out the... I mean, if you're going to... You'd throw both shoes away, wouldn't you? Who throws away one shoe? It doesn't make any sense. Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. This is my 1964 Triumph Bonneville motorcycle. I've had this about 26 years, something like that. Interesting story how I came to acquire this bike. You know, I had been guest hosting on The Tonight Show, and CBS wanted to do a late night show, and I hadn't yet signed a deal with NBC. And there was a buddy of mine named Rod who worked at CBS. He told CBS, you know, you're not going to get Leno by offering him any money. You've got to give him something you would really want. So CBS went and bought this 64 Triumph Bonneville, and they put a plaque on the tank here. It said, hey, Jay, ride on over to CBS. I got it hanging in my garage at home. And uh, they gave me this bike. And I was, oh, wow. So it made me really think about, gee, any network that likes motorcycles, that's got to be pretty good. But ultimately, I went with NBC. But that's how I acquired this bike. And this bike used to belong to the rock star, Adam Ant. This was his motorcycle for a while. It wasn't in as nice a shape as it is now when I first got it. First thing I did was restore it and just go through it. Uh, if you're a real Triumph aficionado, you might notice the stripe on the front fender is probably an eighth of an inch too wide. But other than that, it's pretty much done to risk an original specification. I always liked this gold and white in 1964. I remember this was the bike that was on the cover of Cycle Magazine back in 64. I remember reading it in math class, and I remember Mrs. Parker coming by going, is that a motorcycle magazine? Oh, how nice. <laughs> and she just shredded it. <laughs> it just tore it to bits. I was, I was heartbroken, but yeah, that was it. And that one, I also got an F. But none of that matters now, because I have the motorcycle. You know, this is one of the most classically beautiful motorcycles of all time. Again, I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you later to remark on this. I can't tell if this is beautiful because it's nostalgia, it's what I remember, it's the bike that was cool when I was a kid, or is it the fact that it really is just one of the greatest looking motorcycles of all time? You know, this seemed like such a big bike when I was a kid. I remember one year Triumph had a sticker on the tank for the Bonneville that said, for the expert rider only. I remember we were like 13 or 14 and we didn't have our license yet, but we figured, oh, well that would be us, sure. We're expert riders, that would be us. So that would be the bike to get, the one that said for expert riders only. And then you had the package tray here. They call it a package tray now. We used to call it the castrator because if you hit something, certain parts would catch here and then you'd go over the handlebar. So yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah. One of the disadvantages, a lot of guys took this off. In fact, a lot of guys without kids took this off. Uh, but other than that, the dual carburetors. The Triumph is based on the, uh, the 100, was the T100, I think, that had the single carburetor. And still, oh, the best looking mufflers to me. You know, this was a motorcycle that had Vincent Black Shadow Performance at a much more reasonable price. This was a 120, 120 mile an hour motorcycle, which doesn't seem like a lot now, but back in the day, that was really, really fast. Most bikes would struggle to reach 100, or certainly maintain 100, or they'd vibrate. Whereas these, when they're set up right, oh my god, they ride and handle nicely. There's no, there's really no plastic on this bike, maybe the tail light lens, and maybe the, well that's glass on there. Uh, no, that's about it, that's about the only plastic on this thing. I mean, it's a real motorcycle, and it rides and handles like a real motorcycle. Let's go over some of the specifications of the bike. As you can see, it's a 40 cubic inch or 649cc air-cooled overhead valve vertical twin. Uh, the bore and stroke is 71 millimeter by 82 millimeter. Compression is about eight and a half to one. Uh, you have two Amel monoblock carburetors right here. Ignition is battery and coil. Engine output's about 46 horsepower. Uh, it's a multi-plate wet clutch, and you got a four-speed right foot gear shift lever. And the amazing thing is. The weight is only 363 pounds. I mean, that's, that's pretty light. Even modern bikes now with all the carbon fiber struggle to reach that. That's because there's nothing on this bike. There's no computer. There's no uh, master cylinder with fluid in it. There's no radiator. It's just an air-cooled parallel twin. Uh, your battery and everything is right under here. You lift this up. Let me show you how that works. There you go. And you got a tool kit for when you broke down, and you will break down. That goes right in there. 
but that was half the fun. The nice thing was when this did break down, you knew how to get it home. It was always something pretty easy. Your oil tank is right here. Uh, four speed uh, gearbox, just, just the slightest click of your toe and this thing would shift. You know, when the Japanese invasion started back in the 60s, Honda, Suzuki, all those bikes came in. The reason they were able to beat a lot of the British manufacturers is, is the fact that when the Japanese bikes came to this country, they were ready to go. You open the box, you put the battery in, and you went. A lot of British bikes came in pieces. Front end wouldn't be assembled, uh, whatever. The usually frame and everything was there, but you had to put some of it together. So whoever the motorcycle dealer was, whatever kid he had working for him, sometimes it was a kid, sometimes it was a real mechanic. If it was a real mechanic, you were lucky. And they would put the bikes together, and consequently there were warranty problems, and they didn't follow up the way the Japanese did. I remember reading a story when Mr. Honda came, he went to a dealer and he said, we want to sell 5,000 bikes. And the dealer said, we'll never sell 5,000 a year. He goes, no, 5,000 a month. What? I mean, that seemed impossible because motorcycle sales in the 50s and 60s, it was a bit haphazard. You know, motorcycles were mostly bought by college guys or blue collar guys who wanted to go fast, kind of hooligans. They didn't, people didn't buy them for transportation the way they did in England. And that all changed with Honda, with you meet the nicest people and that whole campaign they had going. So the real problem with a lot of these bikes was sometimes a gas station would be a Triumph dealership. They didn't really have standalone dealerships the way they do now. Sometimes one dealer might sell all the British bikes, Matchless, Royal Enfield, BSA, Triumph, and he'd put a bike together as best he could because the quicker you put it together, the more profit there was in for him. And then they'd sell the bike and then there'd be problems and the usual happens, you know. Uh, if these had been assembled in England the way the Japanese bikes were and put in crates and set over and ready to go, it might have been a, a, a different story. But that being said, they really are just wonderful, wonderful motorcycles. This is probably the golden age of... Uh, British motorcycling the 60s. That's when they reached their peak. Triumph, BSA, they were winning races, they were beating the Japanese, they were beating the Italians, and they got complacent. And uh, that, I think that was the problem pretty much in a nutshell. There are a couple of great books out there, what have happened to the British motorcycle industry and a few other things like that. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, I'm gonna ask you a question at the end of this ride, and I just wanna get your opinion in the comment section. So stay till the end and and let me know what you think. But uh, as far as being a, a good looking bike, boy, it, I don't think they get much better than this. Simple, classic, elegant. I mean, it looks like a guy's bike. You know, it doesn't look like a scooter or any of that kind of deal. It looks like a real motorcycle. And uh, you know, they're really not that hard to keep in tune. You know, if you're the least bit mechanical or you, you enjoy mechanical things, it's very easy to maintain because if you owned one of these, it was a, a point of pride. It wasn't something that you just went back and forth to school with. You know, most guys are in the garage every night tinkering and tightening and polishing and doing whatever they had to do because this was, uh, these things were real, real labors of love. They were just wonderful, wonderful motorcycles. You've got, uh, gauges are pretty simple. You got your uh, tachometer, speedometer, amp meter. That's, that's it. As I mentioned, your battery is under the seat. It's a 12 volt system. Um, you got a stoplight. And once again, the only piece of plastic right there. I think it's time to go for a ride. You know, when I just want to go for a ride, this is the bike I take. Some bikes you take because they're really, really fast. And some bikes you take because they're fun to impress people with because of their uh, mechanical and electronic sophistication. And then there are motorcycles like this that are just nice to ride, you know? I, I, it, I, want, I wonder how much that has to do with nostalgia and how much that has to do with the actual bike itself. Because when I was 16 years old, this was one of the fastest bikes in the world. Triumph 650 Bonneville with twin carburetors, 120 mile an hour top speed. It seemed almost unbelievable at the time. Yet today, the power of this bike would be equal to, in some cases, maybe even a 250. 
But this is a bike that won all the races, and it's still a great handling motorcycle. You know, the modern bikes with their big fat tires and wheels, I mean, they're, they're truly amazing. But this thing just has a lightness. You know, there's a movie I saw once, I didn't like the movie much, but I liked the title. It was called The Incredible Lightness of Being. And that's what I feel like this bike is, The Incredible Lightness of Being. It's no heavier than it needs to be. There's no uh, hydraulic brakes, everything's cable operated. Everything is all fingers and toes, you know, you shift with your toes, you shift with your hand on the clutch. Just the lightest pull and she works fine. And this bike has what they call a sweet spot. You know, modern bikes are smooth all through the rev range. But this one, you get it above 3,500 to between 35 and 4,500, and you're just in the sweet spot where the mirrors don't vibrate and everything is to be running fine. You turn it about, oh, what am I looking at? 60, 65 miles an hour, something like that. A mile a minute used to be pretty fast, and it still is, especially when you run in the back of an SUV. But it just has such a lightness. You know, you, this is a bike you think your way around corners. You know, I, I don't feel myself applying pressure. I'm just thinking I want to go this way or thinking I want to go that way. And that's what happens. You know, the skinny tires, the light wheels. It's just a brilliant, brilliant combination. This was British motorcycle manufacturing at its finest. These mid-60 Triumphs were some of the best bikes ever to come out of England. You virtually had a Vincent Black Shadow performance from a 650cc bike. I think these were about $1,100 when they were new, which seems so ridiculously cheap now, but it was actually pretty expensive back in the day when you were working for a buck and a quarter an hour. A little horn. It almost feels like a bicycle with power. I mean, that's how light it is. You just it's just so enjoyable. And it's the kind of bike when it breaks down, it's real easy to push. You know, bike manufacturing has changed so much. I remember when my buddy bought one, the dealer said, you, you, don't, you know, you don't have to take the head off for at least 7,500 miles. Ah, wow, what a, what a breakthrough in technology that is. But no matter what gear you're in, I'm in fourth right now, you just open the throttle and she pulls away nicely. You know, sometimes you want to put on your racing leathers and go tearing through the hills and maybe go, you know, zoom around with a bunch of other guys. And then there are Sunday mornings, you just want to go for a ride. And that's what this bike is so good at. Ah, it's just so nice to go for a ride. Edwin Turner was a motorcycle genius. His first uh, variation of this bike was, what, 1938, the Speed Twin? and just constant little improvements all through the years. The mid-60s was the pinnacle. I've got a 70 Bonneville too, but for some reason, I like this one better. Back in the 1960s, 100 was the magic number, because a lot of bikes said they could do 100, but very few could. They get up to 96, 97 miles per hour. These could go an honest 120 miles an hour. And these skinny tires give it a nice footprint. It's, it's meaty enough, but still light enough, so you can flick it around. The fun thing I like about this bike, I can actually look at stuff while I'm driving along, you know? Modern bikes are so fast now. Back in these days, you used the transmission to slow down because uh, <laughs> brakes were not as good as they are now. And it worked fine. You know, back in the 1960s, when the Japanese invasion started with Honda and Suzuki and Yamaha, those were all fine bikes. They were all fine bikes mechanically, but they didn't have the handling. They didn't have the suspension that the British bikes did. You know, England still, to this day, has some of the best suspension engineers in the world. 
and these these uh, frames were brilliant, just brilliant. You know, they're just such nice handling bikes. I used to see some of the old uh, road racers back in the 80s come up to the rock store and they'd be riding one of these Triumphs and, you know, some hot shots would be having some, you know, really tricked out Yamaha or Honda or some of that nature. And even though they would have less than 50% of the horsepower of the Japanese bikes, in the twisties, they just walk away from them because these chassis were so excellent. I like the way these bikes vibrate. You know, Japanese bikes tend to buzz a little bit, but these just sort of vibrate. It almost feels like a heartbeat. You know, I just like a parallel twin like this. This one's incredibly smooth. These required a bit more maintenance than the Japanese bikes. About once a month, you kind of went over the whole bike with a couple of uh, uh, Whitworth wrenches, you know, the English wrenches. Uh, or spanners as they call them, just give everything a bit of a tighten, make sure it's all tight. You know, back in the 60s and 50s, 50s and 60s, when guys had these bikes, it was more of a lifestyle than a kind of a fashion choice, you know? Um, because I remember when Honda had that, you meet the nicest people on a Honda. Well, most of the guys I rode with really didn't want to meet anybody nice, just like, <laughs> didn't like to ride bikes. I didn't meet nice people. I just want to ride motorcycles. So consequently, they tend to be more of a individualistic attitude. I mean, Honda, God bless them, really opened up the American public to motorcycling in a way that had never been done before. Because in England, motorcycles were a form of transportation that were cheaper than automobiles. So it actually made sense. Or maybe you put a sidecar on it so you didn't have to pay the road tax that had less than four wheels. But in America, motorcycles were really Oh, you had that movie, The Wild Ones, you know, an easy rider and all this kind of stuff. So it was, it was a different thing. It was more of a hooligan thing here. This bike is a good example of why I like electric cars, but not electric motorcycles. Uh, I mean, I like them well enough. We've had some people come by with some fantastic electric bikes that were really fast, but you can really only go about maybe 100 miles before you have to park it for eight hours and charge it. A bike like this, You'll go riding on a Saturday afternoon. You could do 250 miles before you even realize it. I remember reading a, a Vincent motorcycle road test where the guy went 500 miles before breakfast. He was so impressed with the bike. He got up early, went 500 miles, still was back in time for breakfast. Okay, so let's see what we got here, 64 Triumph Bonneville. You know, taste is what's left after your appetite has been fulfilled. For that, I mean, after you drive or ride all the bikes that go zero to 60 in two seconds and do the quarter mile, the high nines and the low tens, what is it you actually like to ride? And this is a bike you actually like to ride. So this bike would be my taste. Now my question for you is, is it because I'm an old guy and this is the bike that was cool when I was a kid and this is, it's nostalgia that fuels my love for this bike or are, are they actually more fun to drive? Are they actually more interesting motorcycles? I would love to hear what you have to say in the comments section. I'd love to hear from young guys who've driven new bikes and then go back and drive old bikes and hear what they have to say. So I'm just curious. This, to me, in the mid 60s, this was the pinnacle. This was the bike that pretty much said it all and did it all. So let me know what you think in the comments section. See you next week. Thanks, you guys.